All right. Yeah, so uh, I am going to take us through a, a little journey about earthworms, uh, starting with uh, about three, three, almost 400 years ago when uh, they first came into our area. And I'll clarify that a little bit more and then kind of bring us up to date and kind of the newest issue that uh, is coming out of the forest and actually coming to people's uh, gardens and landscaped areas. So and that is a jumping worm. And we'll learn a little bit about it tonight. So how I usually like to do this is just, um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. And at the very end, uh, we can go through the chat questions and then you know, we'll, we'll save time, plenty of time for a conversation. This topic typically does uh, stimulate some good questions. So hopefully that's the case. Uh, currently this jumping worm project that we're, we're on and what I'm kind of presenting through is it's a three year project that started last year. We're, we're in the beginning of year two uh, that is looking at uh, the jumping worm issue in Minnesota. In particular, we're looking at Southeast, the Rochester area, the Twin Cities area, and then the, the Duluth area. Um, and it's funded by the University of Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plant and Pest Center. So, yep, I'm Ryan. Uh, I've been working with worms for about 15, 13, 13 to 14 years now. Uh, I've been the director of the Boulder Lake Environmental Learning Center, which is just 18 miles north of Duluth. And uh, one of my primary focuses is citizen science and this project, uh, the Jumping Worm Project, really lends itself to a really great public participatory uh, project. Again, today we're going to go through about 18,000 years in about 10 minutes. Uh, we'll cover, cover glaciers, ballast, and worms. Um, really going to make a distinction between human disturbed, which is your yard and garden, and these natural ecosystems, which would be our forested ecosystems, and, and, and talk about European versus Asian earthworms. So why earthworms? They're fascinating. They do their job. They do it really, really well, and that's breaking down organic matter. Uh, they've been around for an extremely long time, and there are thousands of different species that are on every continent except Antarctica, um, and they are ecosystem engineers. They really drive uh, what's happening. Why is that important for our area? Um, Every earthworm that you pick up in your yard in the Como Park area is an invasive species. It is not native to our area. Um, they've been introduced over the last few hundred years. And um, as we'll talk about why they have impacts, uh, but the big things is they alter the soil profile. So they alter the soil structure and they change the nutrient cycling. Uh, we'll cover a little bit more about that. But, you know, before earthworms came into the system, it was fungus and bacteria that broke things down and it happened really slowly but our system worked well with that slow release of nutrients. There are some distinctions. Uh, European earthworms um, are, are primarily found in the natural forested systems. And there really isn't an area in the state, unfortunately, that you don't find them now. There really is no earthworm free areas left. Um, and the jumping worms are really found right now in human disturbed ecosystems, your garden, your landscaped yard, uh, the park, with the mulched garden bed in it. And currently, uh, we're really only finding them in the Southeast and the Twin Cities area. Um, does that mean they're not everywhere else? We don't know, but that's part of this jumping worm project is we're trying to find where they are across uh, the, the, the state. This is my favorite earthworm. I would love to get to Australia, to the Gippsland region to see it. Um, it's the giant Gippsland earthworm. It's the biggest earthworm we have. It gets to about six feet long and think of it about uh, the size of a 50 cent piece. So imagine a night crawler about six feet long and the size of a 50 cent piece. Um, they're pretty cool and they're only found in that region. But like I said, there are thousands of variations of, of earthworms all across uh, the world. So our story begins about 18,000 years ago. Now this is a, this is a, or this is, you know, joining all the different lobes that came down to, during the glaciation into one. So remember when the glaciers came down and receded, came down and receded, lots of little fingers. So this is just kind of the culmination of all those fingers. And as you can see, besides the driftless region, you know, all of Minnesota was covered by glaciers. But even further south than the glaciers was permafrost. And that ground was permanently frozen for a long period of time. So the difference kind of between the glaciated region and then the permafrost region, glaciated region, that those mile and a half plus thick icebergs, right, just scraped everything down to the bedrock. So even if there were earthworms here prior to the glaciers, we don't know. They're soft bodied and we really haven't found anything fossilized. 
I gave this presentation a couple weeks ago and I had someone who worked for the wind caves in North Dakota who said, aha, but we have signs. Then when we looked at it, they aren't sure if it really was an earthworm, but it looks like some kind of critter burrowed and it's in the, it's down in the caves and you can see a burrow, but we don't fully know if it's an earthworm or not. But regardless if they were, if they were here or not, they were wiped out with the glaciers. So I think we're probably familiar with succession and primary succession. So after the glaciers came out, we were left with bedrock. And if you ever make your way up the shore and you drive up the North Shore, you see lots of bedrock. We still have lots of the, the, the remnants of the glaciers there. And actually, if you go down uh, by Brighton Beach, you can see the rocks that are in the water. You can see the striations from the glaciers uh, going, pulling north. It's pretty cool. But we started bedrock and then slowly over hundreds of years, thousands of years, we slowly started to build up soil. Small plants, lichens, perennials, and again, fungus and bacteria, that's what broke it down. Happened really slowly. We built up what's called duff, which is a really thick organic layer on top of the mineral soil. Extremely important if you like uh, a lot of our native perennial plants or spring wildflowers, extremely important for that. And then at some point when our forested systems were pretty developed, earthworms were introduced. And when they got here, they said, oh my goodness, look at all this organic matter. I can really do my work here. I was meant to be here. And they come in and they really, really did their work in these forested systems. And they really did it quickly. And, uh, you know, basically the blink of an eye, they changed these systems and, and the forests are still trying to catch up with those changes. So how'd they get here? Worms have been on the move. Humans are really good at moving invasive species across the planet. Um, and how the European earthworms got here is one, buckthorn, garlic mustard, uh, lilacs, they're all European plants. A lot of them were brought over as row hedges um, and, and the new gardens. And so in those root balls, earthworms and earthworm cocoons, which the cocoons hold multiple eggs. Ballast water used to be dirt and rock. In that dirt, earthworms, earthworm cocoons. Um, they also brought earthworms with them because when they started farming the soil, they said, how can we have fertile soil if we do not have earthworms in this system? Brought them with and they were introduced. So again, we're gonna get back to this. We're gonna come back to this human disturbed and natural systems. At first, we're gonna talk about these natural systems and then the human disturbed being your, your gardens and landscaped areas. Here I am, I'm in the, uh, Chippewa, or the Shawamigan National Forest over in Wisconsin. And where, what I'm doing is I'm actually in an earth, one of the few places that are earthworm free still. And I'm in a natural earthworm free forest that is functioning as it has for thousands of years. And what I'm doing right there is I'm actually grabbing that duff layer or organic material and all these fine roots from all the plants are, are holding that organic matter together. And I can roll it up like a mat. And underneath that is the mineral soil. And this duff can be anywhere from an inch thick to inches thick. And again, it's just years upon years upon years of organic matter falling on the ground and slowly decomposing, slowly reducing, releasing its nutrients into the environment. And now if we think about uh, these native wildflowers, if you look at them, a lot of their flowers are small. Their seeds are small. They are small um, it, 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 in relative. When you look at a garden, like a tomato plant, there's a lot of flowers. There's a lot of energy that goes into that system. But our native wild plants really didn't really have to use that much. And so um, what I'm going to show you next is, oh, well, never mind. Um, so here I am, earthworm free. Before I get to the next piece, we're going to talk about that an earthworm just isn't an earthworm. There are multiple, they feed and burrow differently. And how they feed and burrow impacts where they are in the environment. And at first, we're going to talk about these epigeic ones. They are small, tiny little worms. They only live in the organic layer. They don't go into the soil. They are heavily pigmented because they need protection from UV light, but they're really small. So when they come into the system, it takes a long time before you see any impacts from them. The next we have is, we only have one of these, and that is our nightcrawler, right? It's an anechic species, meaning it is heavily pigmented because it comes to the surface, and it eats fresh litter off the forest floor or anywhere that it's at. It pulls that leaf litter into its burrow 
and it can burrow down to about six feet. So adult night crawlers can live multiple years because all they have to do is get below the frost line and they're fine. They just estivate, which is a form of hibernation. They wait till the conditions are right and they come back out the next year. They can consume, they are our largest earthworm and they can consume a lot of organic material. And then we have our endogeic species. These are non-pigmented earthworms. You see them after a rain. So we probably saw lots of them over the last week with the rain. You usually see them on the sidewalk. They're a grayish color. They're the ones that as soon as the sun just barely starts coming out, it fries them. They have no pigmentation because they burrow and live and feed in the root layer, root zone of, of plants. So these ones, if you have these ones in your garden, they're actually kind of a good thing because they're planting nutrient packets right by your, your, um, your root systems. And then there's a special one. It's an epigeic, meaning it lives and feeds on the surface, endogeic, but it does burrow down into the first couple inches of soil. This epigeic endogeic species are associated with some of the biggest impacts with both the European species. And then when we get to the jumping worms, we'll learn that they're an epigeic endogeic species as well. So I'm just gonna, right here, if we go back to that picture of me in the Shawamia National Forest, this site one over here, this is where I was when I was rolling up. And when we sampled, we did not find any earthworms. You see no earthworms in the system, a nice thick duff layer, um, a, a thin A horizon or mineral soil horizon before you get to the, uh, the parent material. And as we went to site two, which was 100 meters away and sampled, you can see we started getting some of these little epigeic species and some of these endogeic and other species. As we continued on to our site to we knew was heavily invaded, we started getting all four of those ecological groups. And it was about five different species. And that's when you get these heavily, heavily impacts. That's where the, the leaf litter falls in, the, in, in fall. And then by mid spring, early summer, that's where you go to these areas where there's nothing but dirt, right? It's really hard. That's when you got these multiple species out there. And when you look at the biomass or the amount of earthworms we found, you can see that it corresponds to the going, the removing of that organic layer and the thickening of that A horizon. And that A horizon is that mineral soil that you'll find in your gardens. So switching species now, there are these four that we kind of have our eye on because they're used for composting worms. So the African nightcrawler, the Indian blue worm, the super red, and the jumping worm. They're all a subtropical species, but they all can live in high densities and they all um, um, have voracious appetites. So that's why they're really good for composting worms. We, this Indian blue worm, we think we found it out in the wild in the Twin Cities, but we'll know more when we do some more sampling this year. But these other ones we really haven't seen outside the compost pile. Doesn't mean that they're not going to survive, but the jumping worms have seen to make, seem to make the transition to our environment with, their, with, the, with the strategy that they use to live very well. They're associated with some of the largest single species impacts. Like I said, with the European earthworms, it's when you have four or five of those species, all those ecological groups together, you see the big impacts. With the jumping worms, it's really one species can have a really, really, really big impact. There is reports and, and what's been kind of known with gardeners in areas that these are heavily invading is nothing grows here syndrome. Plants just aren't growing, they're just dying. And we'll explain kind of the mechanisms of why that's happening. They're really prevalently sold for composting worms and they're easily to purchase online. Typically with the tagline, the best thing you can do for your soil. And uh, that's, that's not, not true. So now we're gonna shift from that natural setting to the human disturbed, your gardens. And we're gonna be talking about this jumping worm project, um, which through this jumping worm project, we're working with people to help us identify where they are across the landscape, because we don't know that yet. And we don't know how prevalent they are. And, and if they're barely here, great. We have a, a there's a lot we can do. Because the best thing you can do for invasive species not introduce them in the first place. Um, but maybe they're prevalent and then we got to really think about management. Uh, how do we manage it? This is one of my favorite pictures of, of a jumping worm. You can see the darker color. Um, all this back here, the soil, that's all earthworm casting. And it's about two to three inches thick. So think of having a two to three inch layer of coffee grounds that you're kind of just mixing your hand in. That's what that is. 
they love mulch. So they're really, really associated strongly with mulch. Not necessarily shredded mulch, but they still like it, but they love mulch chips. And some of the new research that we're finding from last year is we don't know if they're coming in with the mulch or they're able to sense the mulch and they've already been there and they're moving to the mulch piles. And that's one of the things we're uh, uh, gonna tease out this year. Here's an example of a, a taproot in a heavily, in an area with heavily uh, infested with jumping worms. And if you look, you'll see that the lateral roots, if you can see them, are barely there. There's barely any lateral roots, it's just a taproot. So anecdotally, it's looking like these jumping worms, they have an enzyme and they're able to break down woody material directly. European earthworms do not have that ability. Jumping worms are able to eat wood. <laughs> That's what they're able to do. So are they actually directly impacting that root system? We think they might be, but we don't know if they're having direct impacts. We're looking at that. And there's lots of pictures and lots of things that we have of, of people pulling up their plants because they're, they're not attached to the ground anymore. And they just come up and there's hundreds of these jumping worms in the root balls. Here's another example of, of castings, just an image of, this is all earthworm castings. And with jumping worms, this is a terrarium. So an aquarium filled with soil, we put in jumping worms in there, left them in there for a while and saw how they operate. And one of the things you'll notice is they never went below really this three inches below the surface. They just live in that top surface layer. That's where they feed and that's where they do their thing. So we'll get into their life history. There is remarkably little known right now, but we are starting to get to know a lot more. The Arboretum over in Wisconsin has been doing a lot of research in the last three, four, five years. Uh, we're gonna be adding to that over the next couple of years over to what is known in our region. They were reported in the, you know, they've been here since the 19th century. So what was keeping them at bay? What over the last 25, 30 years allowed them, their populations to explode? So this is where they're interesting. They have an annual life cycle. So it's not, it's not our winters that are killing them. They're gonna die in the fall anyway. They're gonna die at the cycle. They don't live, they, they die every year. So they, the cocoons live through the winter. So they lay cocoons um, in the soil. They live through the winter as cocoons. And then when the soil temperature reaches, the soil temperature, not the air temperature, when the soil temperature reaches about 50 degrees, they start hatching. And one of the th cool things that we learned this year is, or last year, is that not all the cocoons hatch at once. So that's one of their life strategies. A proportion of them do. And if it got dry or if something happened, later in the summer when conditions were better, some of the other cocoons would hatch. So here's a picture of the cocoons. And over here on the left, is uh, our biggest and most aggressive jumping worm, that's Agrestis. And over here on the, on the right is our smallest, toc Tocanensis. And you can see the, the size of the cocoon mimics the size of them, the, the earthworm. But why I like showing this is trying to find these cocoons in those soil grains or in those soil castings is darn near impossible. So, Another strategy that they have that have allowed them to be really successful is they are asexual. So it just takes one to start a population. And unlike European earthworms, such as like a nightcrawler, where, where they go from hatching out of a cocoon to being sexually mature or having that ring on them, which means they're sexually mature, that's 130 to 150 days, depending on the, the ideal conditions. Jumping worms can get from hatchling to adult ready to lay more cocoons in just 60 days. So about half the time. So that's how their populations, even though they're uh, annual species, that's how their populations um, go just explode in the fall because they just, they could mature so fast and then lay more cocoons. So their peak abundance so I've seen some current research now, and I haven't changed this slide yet, but I'm, I'm gonna if I, I read some more. Um, I'm reading now that peak abundance is about uh, two to almost 250 individuals per meter squared. So if you think about a three foot by three foot box that is five inches deep, right? Having 
anywhere from 100 to 200 earthworms that are working that soil and eating that organic matter. You can see how they can have these, they can just turn that soil into nothing but castings and really eat all that organic matter and create that nothing grows here syndrome. Just some more pictures of castings and the root balls and how we've seen them in areas where they're where in these gardens, natural setting or uh, uh, human disturbed settings where we see um, earth, the jumping worms. So what are their impacts? So as I said, they, they alter that soil structure. So that top three, four inches, they, it, it's no longer cohesive. It's no longer stuck together like soil grains are. They're not locked. So one, there's nothing for the root system to lock into, but two, there's nothing to keep that soil there. So you get a big rain and you have any kind of slope that all washes down. So if you want an example, you can go on the trails by the St. Paul campus and walk on some of the ones that are uh, kind of on the bottom of the slope. And if you look over there, you'll see that there's open dirt and that all that dirt that's slumped down off there is actually jumping worm castings, all that jumping worm soil. And it's just all sloughed off and ran down. In some places, they've measured it to about two feet thick. So what they're wondering is, Will those jumping worms stay up on top there and do another five inches that sloughs off? And will they eventually do that until it's nothing until it's down to the bedrock? We, we don't know yet. Their preferred habitats, flower beds, mulch, compost piles, and they will be on the edges of your yard in these in these uh, you know under logs and these other shady moist areas. They will be uh, there. You typically do not find jumping or jumping worms in your lawn proper, right? It's, it's too hot, too dry for them. Um, they like the, the compost, they like the flower beds. You will find them in potted plants. So if you're buying potted plants from a landscape or a horticulture, or you know, or uh, uh, you, you want to be, you know, what I suggest is you leave that potted plant somewhere for a few days to observe it before you put it into the ground because. There's lots of reports of jumping worms being in those potted plants. And again, means of spread, composting, fishing bait, horticulture, landscaping. So now we're going to learn how, to, how do we identify them, right? What are some keys? What makes them different in the way they look from European earthworms? Well, they're large. They're a little bit smaller than a jumping worm, but they're pretty big. They're a lot darker. So if you look at a nightcrawler, they're really dark on the head and the top. Jumping worms are pretty well dark all the way around. Um, they're a lot more streamlined. They're, they're almost like a bullet. They're a lot more streamlined. Um, the clitellum, that ring, that means they're sexually mature, is closer to the head. If you remember your, your, your high school or middle school biology and you, you, you dissected your worm, you'll remember their segments, right? And you can count those segments back. And for a European earthworm, you'll count the closest is a 25, the furthest is 33, but that's where their clitellum will start. Jumping worms, it's 14 segments. So it's, re it's really close to the head. And that is something with a hand lens, you're able to count. You don't need special microscopes. You can count that. Their clitellum isn't raised. If you think of, if you can think of like a nightcrawler and it's puffy, they're not puffy. They're just smooth all the way around and it barely raises above their skin. So here's an example of Top is a jumping worm, bottom is a night crawler. And these white lines, those are the segments, right? In between those lines are segments. If we count back, there's 14 before here. And then each one of these that you can kind of see the light on, those are segments. And then these segments get smaller as you move back on the, on the night crawler. But if you count those back, you get to 33. Um, and then the difference again, smooth on the jumping worm, puffy on a European earthworm. Some other keys that you can use, you can use to identify them um, using just simple things like a magnifying glass or a hand lens is they have these setae or tiny hairs. And these hairs are how earthworms move, right? They use these hairs to stick them into the soil as they compress and expand their body and that's how they move. European earthworms only have eight hairs. It doesn't matter what species of European earthworm it is, they only have eight hairs on each segment. A jumping worm has what we call bristles, 40 plus hairs on each segment. 
and you can really see those with a hand lens when they're adults, especially. But if you see a, a bristle all the way around, you know that that is a jumping worm. Again, on top, you know, how we can tell European earthworms apart, the, the, the 16, 17 species that we have are the way those hairs are paired. Jumping worms, bristle, doesn't matter the five different species we have around here, they all feed, look, and have the same uh, setae pattern. They are very active. So if you ever see a worm that's moving unworm-like, almost like a snake, odds are it's probably a jumping worm. Uh, it will, it will uh, secrete a yellowish mucus when it tries to get away, and it will drop its tail, and its tail will sit there and wiggle as they move on off. That is, a, that is an adaptation European earthworms do not have. So I'm just going to show you a short video here. Uh, just a couple seconds that kind of demonstrates all, all those points that I just said. Here again is an area where they're just pulling up that root ball. You know, it's not attached to anything. There's a snake-like movement. All that soil is their castings under them. And here's where you see the tail drop. and they just leave their tail. So while those actions, that snake-like movement, that thrashing around, the ability to drop its tail, its setae, its hairs, its clitellum, where it is located to the head, those are really important for identification. But one of the first things you're gonna notice, especially early spring, because right now they're all tiny and you don't really get to see those characteristics. What you're gonna notice is that soil texture, that coffee ground type texture. Um, it's very noticeable. It, it's very, it, it, like I said, you, you'll put your hand in it and it'll just, it'll just move around very easy. There's nothing in there to hold the structure together. And then again, trying to pick those cocoons out of the, between the castings and the cocoons, really difficult um, to do. And because that soil is able to slough off so easy, you're able to erode or wash away. All those cocoons that are there are washing downhill, downstream with it. So, you know, just like everyone last year, due to the pandemic, right, it kind of hit the brakes on everything. So our project was supposed to start in February last year. But as we were getting wrapped up and we were planning to barnstorm the state, right? We were just going to go out and hit all these counties. And then it turned out, whoa, we can't go anywhere. So now we had to, which turned out to be better because now we're reaching even more people through these types of presentations. But right around, uh, it was the beginning of August. You might remember there was a, 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 bi a kind of a, a blitz that went out, a media blitz that went out about earthworms that the DNR did, University of Minnesota did. There was quite a few articles that happened down there. And the previous five years with this EDMAP or this, this national system for mapping invasive species, we only had a few reports and there were only a few reports in each of these counties. After, oops, after the August 9th or after that media blitz, we ended up expanding the counties that we confirmed them in, but in each county, we have hundreds of reports. So we know that they're really, really in this area pretty heavily. Um, and we're guessing that this is going to expand this year as our outreach expands and as more people get involved in the jumping word project to help us identify them. So one of the things we say is if you have jumping worms, first thing, don't panic, right? It, it's just don't panic, but take a precautions to avoid spreading them. Meaning don't bag up everything and bring it to your landfill. Don't bag up everything and try to bring it to the compost because all you're doing is spreading them. So you just need to find a place in your property that you can kind of contain them. And um, we're really working as researchers to find that mitigation and management ability that we can help do something with them. But there is, there is no known thing yet that we can do to eradicate them from the system. So the best thing to do is not spread them and not introduce them in the first place. If you see them as you're, as you're gardening, and especially in July, August, and September, as you're gardening, as you see them, just remove them. 
Remove them and destroy them. What we tell people, and there is another group through the Minnesota Extension, that once people have identified that they have them, and they have them pretty bad, that they're impacting their garden, there's another group uh, in the, it, in, so I like to say that the jumping worm project is the pre getting people to understand that they're out there, that they're having, uh, they're causing issues and that there's things we can do about them. And then they're the, the, the post and we, we call them the support group because once people see them and they feel like there's nothing they can do, they're working with them to, we're having those groups work with the researchers to test different things to try a variety of different plants, consider alternate landscaping and keep a log of what they're doing. So it feels, it, 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 it's nice because people who felt like, oh, uh, it, it's hopeless. They're seeing that there are things they can do and they're actually helping the researchers understand the, what we can do on a larger level. And then spread the word and follow the research. Uh, the Jumping Worm Project website, um, we're gonna start having another page now that we're actually getting results in some of our research that we're going to start uh, putting that out there so people can see and follow what we're what we're learning and what are the best practices and what are the things that people can do moving forward. And share with everyone, you know, don't buy jumping worms, don't move invasive species, you know, anglers, don't don't dump your worms right on the shore there. They don't dump them in the lake. Earthworms breathe through their skin. If there's oxygen in the lake, they just get down to the bottom and they move their way onto shore. Um, we've kept We've kept night crawlers alive uh, in a terrarium with a bubbler for months. And gardeners, for the jumping worms, gardeners are the number one. You're going to see them. People who are landscaping, people who are working in those human disturbed type areas, you're going to be the first ones to notice these. You're going to see that soil texture. You're going to see a worm that's not acting right. You're going to see plants that aren't that healthy right so you're gonna you're gonna see that and again they get used for vermicomposting and yes they're really good at vermicomposting but you can't tell their cocoons from the soil so you know taking those castings and moving them to your soil you got to weigh the risk of are you just introducing them outside into that but if you use true red, red wigglers which is Icenia fatida which is a European earthworm, which you can tell the difference by those hairs, right? By looking at the setae and some of those other characteristics, you can identify and know, do I have jumping worms or am I using Icenia fatida? We have not found in, in, in Great Lakes Worm Watch's history of 15 years of collecting data and having people send us information. We have never had a report, not saying that it hasn't happened, but we have never had a report of red wigglers, true red wigglers outside of the compost pile. So what you can do is, you know, we say become a worm ranger, right? Help us identify where these are, inform people, have people. It's as easy as, again, starting in July, August, September, going out and looking for the adults. If you're going now, you're looking for that soil signature. You're looking for that grainy coffee ground type soil. And it's really easy. Visually inspect is the first thing to do. And all this information is on our Jumping Worm website as well. Uh, but visually inspect, just look. Do you see that coffee grown soil? Are you seeing earthworms moving weird? Um, second step, physically inspect. Because they're on the surface and just a couple inches down, you don't have to do any kind of special solution to get them to come up. All you have to do is just move the soil around, bring your spade, bring your hole, bring a little shovel and get down there and literally just move it around. And if they're there, you'll come across them. And if you found some, Again, using some of those ID characteristics, which we do have on the website for people to download and utilize as well. Um, but, you know, where is that clitellum? Where is that setae? What colors are they? How are they moving? And then for, for entering the data, it's really easy. If you have a smartphone, it doesn't matter. If just any camera, take a picture of them. And what we say is, do if you're using a smartphone, don't zoom in on them. Just try to get as close as you can with the camera and take a picture because on my end, when you zoom and I then try to zoom in more, it pixelates. If you take the picture normally, I can zoom in a lot further uh, and I'm able to see things. And what we've proven is this is really effective for this. People don't have to send us in samples. 
with a good picture in a, in a, in a short video, I mean like three second videos, we can ID these really successfully if they are jumping worms or not. But again, they have to be adults, which doesn't happen until July, August, September. In September and October is when we have our big jumping worm bio blitz, because that's when you have the largest portion of adults. That's when they're easiest to see, easiest to identify. That's when we try to get people coordinated and out there sampling as many public areas as, as they can. Um, and if they don't find them, not finding them is just as important to know for us as finding them. So if you survey and you go, nope, they're done there, we want to know that as well. Because then that helps us fill out our maps to know, oh, that's, that's an area that they may be to know that, oh, nope, they're not found there. So that was uh, hopefully the quick one. That was the quickish, quickish one. Um, and from there, I'm happy to have a conversation. I see there is, I think there's a chat here. Yeah, there's a question in there. So we, we being the University of Minnesota um, is working with a couple North Korean, North Korean, sorry, Korean uh, uh, researchers and that is some of the stuff we're asking and, and trying to figure out is we know that some of the plants over there have uh, uh, natural defenses and we know that they have uh, a lot more predators there than they do here. They're really, they're, our plants don't have natural defenses for them yet and they don't really have all that many predators. Um, there are the, the same predators that are eating earthworms or jumping or uh, European earthworms, but nothing like uh, um, they have in their natural origin. But again, we're going to be learning a lot more about them with this partnership with the researchers that they're working with. So that's exciting. Oh, I can share the link. Give me a second here. Back out. And so that's a good question. Uh, the range of them. So what we think is is uh, they don't they don't really move that fast, and and we know that European earthworms really uh, it, it's really about. 10 to 15 uh, feet a year that they, they move, right? And that's really just in movement when their food source isn't there. So when they get, their populations get really big and they've kind of consumed all that organic matter, that's when they're going to start moving. So we do think that uh, jumping worms move a little faster, um, but it's not just the adult worms itself that are moving. Remember, in that soil, in that castings that are getting washed away, right, are potential cocoons, with more potential jumping worms in that are then being relocated. So they're moving in, in multiple ways, um, not just human disturb or human ways. <laughs> so if you find them in your vegetable garden, you know, it, it, it definitely, it depends what, what level and what stage you're at. Um, people that have, are, are aware of it and know some of those early signs to look for, have been having some success in, in mitigating and managing the populations, right, before they get too big. The people that are, um, you know, that, that didn't know about it and they're only aware of it after the fact of this nothing grows here syndrome and these populations get pretty big, they've been having issues uh, doing that. But like I said, that support group, <laughs> that group with extension, um, you know, they're, they're really working on to make sure that, you know, you're not screwed if you get them, like they're finding ways and different combinations. And I do believe over the next few years, we're gonna, we're gonna know a lot more about really how to mitigate their impacts. So they are, they are a pri do they compete with mushrooms and other decomposers? So yeah, they, they're basically the king decomposer, right? They're really, really good at that. And there's a lot of research out there on European earthworms and their effect on mycorrhiza fungi in the forested systems 
And there are people starting to look on that connection of, of jumping worms, you know, and their, their impacts on it. But yeah, they, they will take an area and they will consume all that fuel that typically mushrooms would have used to decompose, right? And the other, those other decomposers. So how do you mitigate and manage? Again, those are things we're working on. And, um, you know, there are some natural elements such as saponins, right? That are in, in like tea tree oil. There is elemental sulfur. Um, there is uh, uh, a few others that they're, they're starting to look at. And this year is a year that they're doing those microcosms and those studies. So they're gonna be actually, they got the plots going, they got all the cocoons they need. They're gonna start rearing the jumping worms. They're gonna start testing these different things to see what impacts they have. So there are uh, two main researchers out of the Twin Cities campus that are really looking at the mitigation side of it. And that's Dr. Lee Freilich and Dr. Kyung Soo. Um, and they, if, if, you've, if you've followed forestry uh, at all and with the university, Dr. Freilich has, has been a big part of that research. And, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you may, may know him. Uh, he's been a part of that. So he's doing a, uh, a lot of it. And then we got, you know, there's, there's graduate students, you know, that are working with them on other, other issues too, or other parts of it. And then we have, um, like I said, other partnerships with other uh, groups in, in different areas. Tea seed oil. Great. Are there any other questions? And, and we know like with this, you know, it, people, people want that answer, right? They want to know what to do. And, and what I, unfortunately, what I tell people is have me back in three years and I'll have some answers for you after this is, after this is done. But uh, we're, we're learning. And that's why on that jumping worm site, we will be continuing to update. Like when we learn something that has an impact, we're going to put it there. We're going to get that word out. Um, we're going to be that outreach uh, arm of it to make sure that, um, you know, people are aware and then they know the safe things they can do. So I do want to address one of the things that um, keeps coming back is, uh, you know, using herbicide or pesticides, right, to remove them. And we got a lot of people who have said they've either tried that or they want to try that. And, and they're looking at that. And are we doing something with that? Well, it is a law. If it's not listed, if the use is not listed on there for how to use it, which, which worms are not listed on those materials, it's illegal to use them in that way. So we just have to put that disclaimer out, uh, not, not to use that if it's not listed for that use. So bait stores, um, you know, we, we had a really good push with European earthworms because, so, you know, European earthworms for the longest time, it was, what was the main vector? Were they a terrestrial invasive, meaning were they distributed and coming across land, or were they aquatic invasive because they were being introduced through the aquatic system, which is how we originally found them uh, coming out of lakes, literally coming out of lakes. And so uh, fishing bait was identified as kind of one of the top vectors of the way those were being spread. So there was a lot of education and work done with, with uh, bait stores and bait sellers on on the impacts that they were having. Um, we're not, I'm not aware right now where that is in the conversation with jumping worms. Um, we're, we'll get there, but right now for, for us in the outreach we're doing is it really is compost and mulch seems to be the biggest concern right now and getting, <laughs> getting coordinated with that. It, do you think it would help to look for them in uh, specific months and pull them? Um, yes. So that's why we say September and October is the best time to look for them because that's when they're adults and that's when you can easily identify them with a hand lens, naked eye, a picture. Um, but right now, if you had them last fall, you will see their soil signature right now. You may see a lot of little worms that are European worms when they're when they're uh, juveniles or smaller hatchlings, 
they tend to move around a little jerky too. So you can't use the movement when they're small as the definitive indicator that it is a jumping worm or not. That's late in the summer. So it is, it's, it's the kind of July, but it's that September, October. And we kind of leave August out, right? Because it's kind of dry. All earthworms kind of slow down in August because dry. It's that September, October, when the soil moisture starts building up again, the temperature is still warm. They start becoming active again. Any other questions? It's a great question. Oh, and then I, I, the, the when do they lay their cocoons? Um, basically, right after they're sexually mature, they can start laying their cocoons. And I, I think it's, I think what we know is it's about, uh, it, it's one cocoon every couple days. And I think with jumping worms, I think they have two to five worms in each cocoon. So they are looking at what kind of plants they prefer. We don't have a definitive answer on that yet. Um, but that work that the extension group's doing where they're, they're trying different plantings in areas that they know that these people have had heavy impacts with these, um, they're starting to see successes in different things. I don't have that list yet, but uh, I would imagine that by the end of, you know, in a few months or by the end of summer, we'll have a better list uh, that we'll be able to share with people of, of what's working that uh, seems to mitigate or not have such big impacts by them. Is it okay to pull and dispose of every worm in your garden? So, you know, it, when I like to distinguish between the natural system and the human created system, your garden, right? When we hear, and we've heard a lot of research on earthworms, in the agricultural setting or the human disturbed setting. They make the soil less dense. Their burrows allow infiltration of water to get down there. Their castings are nutrient packets, right? So in, in an agricultural setting, European earthworms have a really positive impact. It's in the natural setting where they actually make it more dense. They change the nutrient cycling. They change how things work. So. If you have European earthworms in your garden, right? I, 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 they're already everywhere in the state. They have, you know, they they, they do tend to have a positive impact. So, I, I, I would, I would, I would have to leave that up to the individual if they want to remove every earthworm from their garden. Again, yes, they are all invasive. But there is uh, a, 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 a there's a gray area there. If if that was if you were talking about your your forest to land up by the boundary waters, I would say absolutely anyone you see, get rid of them, get rid of them. But if you're talking in the middle of a city uh, that that is primarily human disturbed, they they may be having the European ones may be having a positive impact on your garden. Mm. This is really great, Ryan. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. This is very informative. And we're, we're happy to field other questions as people move forward. Um, this is a, I, I will put one plug in for the, the Jumping Worm project itself, the, the, the surveying and the citizen science aspect of it. It's really easy and you're already out there. If you're working in, you know, if you're already working in your yard and your gardens or the, the public gardens and the, the areas around, you know, you're already doing it. So it's just like, just keep your eye open. Keep looking for that soil texture. Keep looking for later in the summer. Keep looking for earthworms that are moving really weird. And all you have to do is get a picture of it. If you have something, it tends to be something with a tan background or a grayish background. We used to think white worked, but white kind of washes it out. So if you have something that's light, but tannish or grayish, just set it on there get a picture of it and send it our way. And you know, we don't need exact locations. Like it would be nice if we had the exact GPS coordinates of where you found it. But if you tell us it was on this block, right? Or it's between these cross streets, that's fine. That, that, that we, that's still better than better information than we have now. So it's, it's low impact and it's, it's really simple to do. That's great. Thank you, thank you, and we'll hopefully be in touch with you more as you learn more.
too. Awesome. And like I said, we'll, we'll do our best to keep that uh, uh, website being dynamic and keep it updated. <laughs>